you need to forgive, but you don't know how to do it? Let's talk about it with Mark Goodman on Steve Brown, etc. He's, he's an old white guy, an author, broadcaster, and seminary professor who's sick of religion. And he's brought friends. Please welcome Steve Brown, etc. Hey, we're so glad you're here. We've got a great program today. You don't want to miss a bit of this. It's not for me. There's some people I'm not going to forgive. I'm just <laughs> not. And uh, and I don't care what our guest says. I'm still not going to forgive. We, we were talking earlier about my hearing loss, which I attribute to my former pastor when we were out shooting. And I have yet to forgive him, and this program isn't going to change that. <laughs> I just want to make that statement before we go. By the way, I'm Steve, the <laughs> aforementioned old <laughs> white guy. <laughs> Matthew Porter's here, and a belated happy birthday to you. Matthew recently turned 40 eight years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and our producer Jeremy's in the little glass booth. Jeremy says a gentleman is a guy who knows how to play the bagpipes, but doesn't. <laughs> you have to count me as not a gentleman then. I can't play the bagpipes. <laughs> That's the only instrument you can play. Our one-man IT department, John Myers, is in the tech bunker. John knows with great power comes a great power bill. <laughs> he is in the process of planning his lighting display for Christmas, and it is awesome, and we'll show you later on. You won't believe what he has done to his home and to his neighbors. <laughs> and Dr. George Bingham is the president of Key Life. George says the best way to save money is <laughs> this is so bad, Dude, uh, Matthew? I can't believe right. you're this. Right. Is sound financial the, advice? Uh, okay, go. The best way to save money is to forget who you borrowed it from. <laughs> <laughs> and Kathy Wyatt is the soft feminine side of the program. Kathy says the only thing that's unforgivable <laughs> are these jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Accurate. <laughs> we we um we have a great guest uh, during this program. You don't know him, but I do. I've spent the morning with him, and uh, he's got a story that'll curl your toes. I mean, it is just plain wild. And um, I'm addicted to calmness and quietness and order and decency. He's addicted to chaos. <laughs> Or was for a lot of it. Or you're going to hear his story, and it's going to blow you away. He's a forgiveness coach, speaker, and author, and founder of 70 Times 7 Paths to Forgiveness. That's a nonprofit organization founded to promote the message of freedom through forgiveness. Mark's new book comes out in December, on December the 1st, and uh, if I had one, I would hold it in my nicotine-stained fingers, but I don't. But I read a digital copy, and it's titled, and you ought to write this down, Forgiving a Good Man, an Abuse Survivor's Story of Freedom Through Forgiveness. And by the way, I don't know where this interview is going to go, but it might get a little bit raw. So if you have uh, some children that are listening or watching this, you might want to tell them to go out and play in the traffic or something. <laughs> <laughs> but probably this might not. Well, it might be, but it might not be appropriate because, um, because our guest, Mark, has a fairly raw story. So you might want to think about that if you have kids, uh, little kids, little ears uh, around listening or little eyes watching. Mark, I don't know where to start, frankly. I mean, I, you know, I just kept thinking this is enough, and then I'd go to the next next chapter, 
and there was more, and I'd say that was plenty, and I'd go to the next chapter, and there was more. But kind of give us a version, I know, uh, uh, of your background. Give us some of your story so we can kind of get a feel of what you had to forgive. It's great to be with, here with you. Thank you, Steve, and thanks for the disclaimer. I think it's quite appropriate. And I want to give my hats off, not hair off, to Kathy, because um, I must say that I'm a very forgiving guy, but I don't know if I can forgive based on those jokes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's just too much. Wow. Wow. Well, you're old enough, Even we count on limits. forgetting. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, I always like to say you can forgive or forget, you get one or the two, you don't get both. <laughs> Listen, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a, a, a crazy story, but it's um, it's one that's very close to home. As a, as a teenager, I lived homeless on the streets of L.A. Um, and we're talking about eating out of dumpsters, um, soup lines. But you you want to give enough, us some hints about, I, I mean, you learned the art of eating out of a dumpster. And oh, one of the principles of your life <laughs> comes from that. Tell us what very that much. is, and then we'll go on with the story. And for any of you that are living homeless out there in L.A. right now, I'm going to tell you, there's a dumpster back behind the grocery store of Malibu. Mwah. I think I can do Five stars. Oh, five star all the way. I'm telling you, it's great. But don't yeah, get from look, the sides, right? Nothing off the sides, nothing off the top. It it's almost, acts almost like a cooler if you take off the stops and the off the top there and there's wonderful stuff underneath there and and yes there is an art form to it and there's an art form to just walking up to people start a conversation next thing you know would you like to have a meal with me uh, there's a real art form to it well Agreed. don't don't thank us we were glad to help continue well, with I'm your glad story to help. you know for all your viewers right now they're struggling with the right way to live homeless i think we just help them good okay good start Listen, um, but I have great memories of that because it was actually a step up. It was an, a, an improvement over what I had growing up in Detroit. Now, first of all, it's Detroit. I'm sorry for your listeners in Detroit. I'm sorry. It's kind of like Trent, New Jersey without the glitter. I mean, it's, it's tough <laughs> enough. Wow. <laughs> um, it's oh, tough enough to live in Detroit. Mm. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. They sent them all my way. Um the, the dangers on the outside, are, some are known, some are unknown. For me, it was the dangers inside of my home from parents who were alcoholic. Um, but it was my dad. My dad was abusive. I have three older brothers. I was the youngest of the group. And with my other older brothers, he used to, uh, when it physically abusive, to the point where he would beat them to their almost unconscious. Uh, my oldest brother, he picked them up and threw them out the front picture window. Oh, uh, in my house, I had bumper stickers on my bedroom door, not for decorations, but to hide the holes in it where different family members had come at with a bat or a knife. Um, mm -hmm. Sure, it was dangerous. And so California, living homeless, was a step up. It was safer. It was better. And so that's why I have good memories of it. Oh, man. But it, the physical, it didn't stop at the physical abuse. My dad sexually abused his own boys. So if, if one can imagine for a little boy to be sexually abused is one thing, to have it happen by your own father can be brutal. And especially for believers, I mean, I love William P. Young said it took 50 years of the shack, 50 years to get the face of, G, of his own father off the face of Jesus. And so to hear those words, heavenly mm -hmm. father, could be quite painful for the, those of us who had fathers that were abusive. Now, my brothers, they didn't fare so well. My oldest brother passed away a couple of years ago, just full of anger, holding on to that backpack of pain, shame, blame, resentment, anger. Do you know what happened to me? My next oldest brother lives in a special apartment in Florida, surrounded by walls. When I say walls, they're imaginary walls. He has no friends. He stays to himself. He's got Im imaginary friends, but it's safer for him to live in that imaginary world then the memories he has, mostly it for him, it was age 12 where the abuse was the worst oh, of having those memories. Now, he's schizophrenic, right? 
What's that? I'm sorry. He's schizophrenic. Schizophrenic. That is correct. Okay, go ahead. Absolutely. And I just love him dearly. He's got the uh, heart the size of Montana. Yeah. And then my middle brother, the very brother that taught me business and led me to the Lord at age 15, called me. And while on the phone call, he took his own life. Oh, man. Now, the wounds of unforgiveness can be brutal. Although on his death certificate, it said suicide. You know now, and I know that it should say he died of unforgiveness. And that's mm. exactly what he died from, holding on to that pain. And here I am, Steve, trying to make sense of it. I've got a beautiful life, a beautiful wife, six gorgeous girls, 13 grandkids, one of the happiest guys you ever met. How does that make sense? That here I am, oh, different man. from the other brother. Guys, you don't want to miss a bit of this story. And when the book comes out, you want to get it. Forgiving a good man, and I use good uh, in a very broad sense. Forgiving a good man, an abuse survivor story of freedom through forgiveness. And we're talking to Mark Goodman, and we're exploring some little bits of his story. And it's going to blow you away when you learn that there is power in letting it all go and forgiving. Jesus said it. It was right then, and it's right now. taking time to be with us. We're talking to author and speaker Mark Goodman. His new book is called Forgiving a Good Man, an Abuse Survivor's Story of Freedom Through Forgiveness. Mark, on the other side of the break, we were talking about your story, and uh, it gets a lot worse or better as you go through it. I don't know how you lived all this. I mean, this is just plain amazing. By the way, Mark has an unusual ability to make money. We're going to hit him for a contribution as soon as this program is over. <laughs> but he literally has had dinner from a dump in California and with kings, literally. But anyway, go ahead with your story. You're in California, you're eating from a dump, you went over your three brothers, and that's a sad story. So sad, if I think about it, it'll get to me. Uh, what? Go ahead, tell us more of what was happening. Sure, so um, although I felt the safety, the freedom, so I thought, from running away in California, uh, I decided to come back. So. My brother that I was out there with decided to stay. So I give me a backpack, $20, a loaf of bread, two cans of pork and beans, and I'm going to hitchhike from LA back to Detroit. My. And so I did. So you understand now back then there was no cell phone. Nobody knew where I was, where I was going. Uh, forget finding the body. They wouldn't even know where to look for the body. And off I went. I made it as far as Cheyenne, Wyoming, in hitchhiking, stuck there all day long. I walked back to a truck stop where two super nice cowboys saw my dire situation and decided to help me out. And I uh, mm. said, look, got a place to stay, shower, good meal, and get you back on the road tomorrow morning. And I did. And unknowing that I was walking into the very nightmare of which happened in our house, that those... Um, that I was sexually abused in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Mm. And uh, I was they were nice enough to drive me to the uh, Greyhound bus station the following morning. And um, I called my grandfather and I said, please don't ask any questions. I can't just, if you'll get me a bus ticket from Cheyenne back to Detroit, I just beg of you. And he did. And needless to say, that's the last time I've ever hitchhiked. Mm. Oh man, that was, 
And that uh, you uh, that incident, by the way, you thought you were going to die. You thought he was going to kill you when he came in uh, at later that night. I, that must have been uh, it. Must have been awful. What happened was bad. Was bad. It was really bad. But um, I was able to finally. I, I had not slept in probably two days. Uh, on the couch, finally was able to get to sleep a little bit. I wake up at four o'clock in the morning, only to find him sitting in the chair, just watching me. It's like the worst um, yeah. horror movie that you can possibly think. And I really thought that that's correct. I, that I was, I was a dead man. And uh, need to say as tired as I was, I could not fall back to sleep again and uh, made it out there. did what I needed to do to make it out alive. Yeah. And you, so you got a bus ticket, you're heading back home. Um, things had changed a little bit, hadn't they? It, it, it changed a lot. And um, I realized that I was walking down a dead end street, back to Detroit, worked in a transmission shop with my brother where he carried, uh, so dangerous, he carried a gun in his back pocket. If somebody would shoot me, he would shoot them, they wouldn't get away. And between what I grew up with and what I've been through, I knew I was a dead man walking. And so not knowing a soul, I packed up everything I had and I headed down to Florida, Tampa Bay, Florida. And um, I attended a seminar by Brian Tracy, thinking I'm going for business purposes. And what he shared was, if it's to be, it's up to me, that I have a choice of my emotional and um, uh, spiritual and financial future that I can't blame looks to the past, responsibility looks to the future. And all of a sudden I started equating that to forgiveness some way, somehow that you mean I have a choice. I don't have to stay angry. I don't have to stay resentful. I don't have to carry this backpack of pain, shame, and blame uh, this whole time. And that was an incredible epiphany to me that I have a choice. And life changed almost uh, drastically, almost overnight. And even without a college degree, I worked on a particular career um, in technology. And within, by age 40, I was a CTO of a publicly traded telecom company. And um, just going places in a, it's just a beautiful family. But I was mm. still wearing the mask. And that was the big, the big part. How many of you people that you know or are listening right now that have been through some really bad stuff? I don't know what it was. I don't know who did it to you, but you have every right to hold on to that blame, shame, pain. We don't make it through life. We don't make it through childhood without emotional scars, often, often of our own doing. But then okay. we have a choice. And that choice is forgiven. You know what I'm surprised about, Mark, is um, I grew up in Asheville, by the way, so I'm very oh. familiar with Ben Lippin and uh, and that school that you attended for two years. I don't even forgive them. <laughs> I mean, you kissed a girl and they wouldn't let you come back to school. I mean, if you had slept with her or if you had done a strip club thing, I maybe would understand it. <laughs> but you just packed her and they said you couldn't come. You had to forgive them, too, didn't you? Oh, that's what the beauty about religion versus relationship with God. Yes, it's all about what you do, should do, did do, um, and yet to do. Yeah, very much so. And so it was very strict. And I was able to get away, though, for a couple of years to Ben Lippin. And it showed me that there's another world out there. And that was for my uh, sophomore yeah. and junior year in high school, that there's another world out there. It's not all that crazy. People are not all beating each other up and doing these nasty things. Mm. But yeah, they caught me. She was rubbing her hair, hands through my hair. Mm. Yeah, this well, is Chris, a sad back a while ago. <laughs> they found out about two times that we had, you know, kissed. <laughs> I, I know. Please don't hold that against me. And so uh, they asked me not to come back for senior year. That's it. You're done. You're not a good enough Christian. Be back here because you know you're you're out there kissing girls at age sixteen. Mm. Wow. Yeah. How, how could you, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, the question I think is hanging in the air for everybody listening, and we will have to tee it up now and hit it on the other side of the break. Is after this revelation, what of your dad? What happened to him? What happened? Did you guys reconcile, or was it more still estrangement? Um, 
and we'll have to just oh. there. It's a great story. You're not going to believe it. In fact, if I didn't know Mark, if I hadn't lived with him all morning, I wouldn't believe a word of this. These kinds of things just don't happen. But it's going to blow you away when you when you hear some of the rest of this story. If you're wondering, we're talking to Mark Goodman, and his book is, it's not out yet, going to be out December the 1st, Forgiving a Good Man, an Abuse Survivor's Story of Freedom Through Forgiveness. Hey guys, this is really hard work, and we're all tired, so we'll have some cookies and milk, and then we'll come back. and speaker Mark Goodman. By the way, if you want to check up on some of this, you can keep up with Mark's work at 70 times 70. That's 70 and X7, 70 times 7.org. And on X at 70 times 7, forgiveness. Mark, before the break, you had told us your story of growing up being abused uh, by your parents, particularly your father, in every uh, way imaginable to an unbelievable degree. You come to this point of learning about forgiveness and learning to let go and finding freedom through that. So then other side of that, what happened post that in your relationship with your father? I mean, if you, if you just forgave him and never spoke to him again, that alone would be miraculous. Yeah, big. Fine. You'd be like, that'd be a success story. What did happen? That's a great question. So um, the difference between forgiveness and reconciliation, right? Forgiveness only takes one side. It's one side of a two-sided transaction. It's a debt that can't be paid back. What can my dad ever say or do to make that scales of justice even? And so, yes, I learned to forgive him subject to nothing. Reconciliation takes both sides. But along the way, I got the phone call. My mom called and said they had sobered up. They were in a 12-step program. They had turned their life over to God, and it changed. Mm. And it's amazing, that same monster that should have gone to jail for the rest of his life, the last 23 years of his life, he's no longer with us, the last 23 years, turned into, one of, turned into a, the most wonderful godly men you've ever met. If he were, you spent time with him, you and got to know him, you would say, baloney, Mark, there's no way this man equals that story. And that's exactly it. And what I learned was that you're never too old. You've never done too much bad to find God's redemption, grace, and forgiveness. And my dad taught me, my dad taught me, along with what I learned with the Lord, that nothing, nothing is unforgivable. And that's the beauty of it. And we ended up reconciling. And I don't know if I can get this up here or not. There's mm. a picture of picture of my dad and I. Right there. Oh, yeah. man. Wow. Mm. Having a wonderful time together. And if he met you at the store, he'd say, Steve, can I pray for you? Yes. And he'd, he'd just write down Steve. Now, he couldn't remember <laughs> what it was. But before he, he died, he had a list of all sorts of different names. And we had a wonderful time. And I said, Dad, do you realize you're a prayer warrior that sometime in the next 24 to 48 hours, you're going to be sitting there right next to Jesus. And we're laughing. We're literally having a great time. He's getting ready to go to Disney World. I said, let's rewrite your prayer list. But I want my name on top. <laughs> <laughs> You owe me we that. Wrote, <laughs> oh, you owe me. You owe me. And we wrote that prayer list. And when he passed away, he had that in one hand and holding my hand in the other. With the, um, And it was just a wonderful time oh, together. Mm. So, so the power of forgiveness was the freedom, the freedom that I had not to carry that around another day, but the power of reconciliation when the 
offender and decide to have a relationship, that is even at a different level. It's hard to comprehend at times. Do you have to, when you when you reconcile, do you have to bring them back in your life and trust them 100% or do you got to be careful? Always be careful. Um, just because there's a debt that's owed and you write off the debt, yeah. Right. If I write off the debt and file bankruptcy, what happens to my FICO score? Right. Um, it's pretty bad. <laughs> yeah. And so I like to call it a relational credit score. So just like that, I can you don't owe me another single thing, Dad. However, we're going to walk into this very carefully. Your relational credit score is 200 <laughs> and it's going to take time yeah. to build it up. And that's smart. And it may not be with some people. Just because you can forgive them doesn't mean they earn their right back. And, you know, you got to stay away. Yeah, that's smart. Uh, Mark, and it sounds like he um, he he asked for forgiveness. Did did he remember all the uh, abuse? I mean, did that did, was that part of his request for forgiveness if he did? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, because I had forgiven subject to nothing, I didn't need to know that. Hmm. My oldest brother on his deathbed demanded his apology, which my dad gave. And my dad did an amazing job of, in detail, I am sorry for physically abusing, sexually abusing you. Hmm. Give my dad credit. That's what my brother needed. Hmm. However, within 48 hours, my brother went right back to being angry again. Because yeah. that is never enough. Yeah. yeah. Can I and and just as a follow up, you you mentioned and this is going to not give you time to answer it, but uh, you talk about the four different types of abuse, and uh, you basically experience them all primarily from your dad, but there was also, in a sense, some from your mom as well, right? That is correct. And there's the the one of uh, emotional or verbal, um, physical sexual and the one of omission neglect mm -hmm. and anybody who has grown up under neglect knows exactly what i'm talking about how it can affect your self-worth and such and so my mom was drunk busy off in other areas um, and even and left so, the home for a while she left for two left years for, she, for two years that is correct guys we're going to pursue this story and we're going to get down and talk about some principles of forgiveness we're talking to Mark Goodman, and his book is Forgiving a Good Man, an abuse survivor's story of freedom through forgiveness. You, you, you don't want to miss any of this, because you need it, and I need it too. places you want to go and I've got a thousand to go with Mark but you might want to write this down and it's the number don't spell it out 70x7.org and on x formerly known as twitter at 70 the number x7 the number forgiveness Mark I think the for what it's worth, I think the problem with forgiveness is that we've we've misquoted what that means for so long. You know, you hear people say, well, I can forgive, but I'll never forget, M making it sound like those things are, are separate. And then you have other people that say, well, if you can't forget, then you haven't really forgiven Um I just think that there's a a lot of misunder uh, a lot of misunderstanding that we we get all that wrong. Can you kind of break that down a little bit? I mean, how much how much of that is is actually accurate and how much of it is needs to be thrown out with the wash or thrown out with the garbage, no pun intended, into the dumpster. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, look, um the Bible refers to forgiveness often in the form of a debt. Right. There's a debt that somebody did you wrong and there's a debt that exists. And so um, if you had a debt 
and you decided to write that off, if you went to your accountant and said, hey, I just want to write that off, what would they say? They said, well, from whom? How much? What would You can't just in general terms. And people do it all the time. And they think, oh, I forgave them a long time ago. But if their house burnt down, it would serve them right. Right? <laughs> it's maybe not there yet. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, boy. Read maybe, my mail. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. They're not quite there yet. And so in done properly is there is an accounting for it. Uh, when I went to forgive my dad, I actually interviewed family members and school friends to, if I want a full accounting, what I am going to be writing off in the debt. And you know what I found out? It was a lot worse than what I remember. Yeah. Somehow or another, I blocked a lot of it out and it was worse than what I even remembered. But I got it all out there. And is there anything else? Anything else? That is the debt that I'm going to write off. And I did it for him as well as me. And here's what big difference is. The different levels of forgiveness. We think of forgiveness as on or off. No, there are different levels. And the first is just being decisional. It's just, I'm doing it for me. The classic, don't do it for them, do it for me. And it's often been my head. But I still don't feel that way. I'm still triggered by it. The next step, if you can get where you can actually reframe and give it as a gift for them, an, an altruistic gift that I'm doing for them is as much as I'm doing for me. Imagine that, that, that that's what it's for. It's actually for giving. Oh, oh wait, it's, it's called for giving. That's right. Mm -hmm. It's in a gift for them. And then I can feel it. And that's where the huge difference comes in because we're triggered by how we feel, not how we think. And so I could reframe what I thought about my dad, remember the good things and forgive completely. And now I'm not triggered by it. And then real quick, the final one, the third level is spiritual forgiveness, where it becomes the actual remission of it as though it doesn't exist, that you're handling it ver horizontally as much as you, we handle it vertically, just like the Lord gives the remission of our sins reconciled with him and that the sin is no more that is the ultimate level where you can be totally free so if you want to be totally free spiritual forgiveness is where to be mark i think a lot of folks would hear your story and could walk away with the feeling of okay mark forgave that massive thing i ought to forgive this much smaller thing Almost a guilt kind of thing when I think in reality, the, the it's more so like if somebody like me just went and bench pressed 500 pounds and be like, where did that power come from? I feel like that's the real story here is God has given you the power. It The size of the debt is almost irrelevant. The point is where that power comes from mm -hmm. and your life makes it an undeniable reality. And mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Speak to that a little bit because it's not you. It's not something you've done. Matthew nailed it. I, and when you read the book, you'll see my progression from decisional forgiveness, finally make a decision, but I'm still emotionally attached to it, to, to finally feeling different, to finally being spiritual forgiveness where I'm totally free. And look, um, I love to uh, tie it in together where 70 times seven comes from, from Matthew, right? Um, and only I like to reframe it. If this happened last week, if you go along with me for a little bit, is that Peter and Jesus are driving in a Honda, and, and right because we know that because Jesus and disciples were all in one accord. We know that. <laughs> they're, they're I don't driving want any more grief from anybody else. <laughs> you and Matthew should go. We, we got to hang out. <laughs> we got to do it. <laughs> so they're driving down I seventy five, and Alexis cuts Peter off not once, not twice, but seven times. And he turns to the Lord and says, right, look at me at seven times. And of course, Jesus said not seven times, but 70 times seven, we should always forgive. Now, the reason I like to put in that context is because it applies to our everyday life. First of all, let's give Peter a little credit. I don't know about you, but Alexis cut me off seven times. I'm not sure how well I would do with it. Let's throw up a bone. But the point being is that person has gone off and they're out of your life. Yet you show up for work angry and resentful and and have relationship issues and hanging on to that. And so is it with whether it's a small thing, like being cut off in the freeway, or a big thing with a father that's so abusive. All the rules still apply. You have a choice. But I was a victim. You were a victim. But 
Victims are powerless. Victims have no control of their lives. Victims have excuse for any kind of behavior. And we have a choice with the Lord to be free, happy, joyous. And just like John 10, 10 says, it's the fullness of life. Oh, man. I'll tell you, we got one minute left, Mark. Um, and by the way, as I read your story, I had places that I could identify. I'm an adult child of an alcoholic, and I got all the stuff that goes with it. What should I do first? I love that. And the first is, is enough, enough. I do meet with people that are carrying around this anger and resentment that do not want to let it go. Just like my oldest brother, I identify this. This is who I am. I am. I can have excuse for anything. So if you want to hang on to that, that's your choice. And of course, it affects all your other relationships. Or if you decide enough is enough, my shoulders are tired, please, Lord, what can I do? Uh, come to 70 times 7 that's 70x7.org. We have lots of different resources. If you're on Facebook, Path to Forgiveness, lots of resources, and walk you through what we call the REACH model. There's not one size fits all, so you have to apply it to you in the REACH model of walking you down those steps so that one day you can be totally, totally free. And that's what I hope and pray for every person listening here. Oh, man. Mark, thank you for writing this book. Thank you for living the life that you did that backs it up. And thank you for taking an hour and spending it with us. Hope we can do it again, man. Hey. Thank you very much. I love you guys. Hey, and that's back at you. <laughs> the name of the book is Forgiving a Good Man, an Abuse Survivor's Story of Freedom Through Forgiveness. It's not out yet, but it'll be out in December, and you ought to get it. Guys, we're going to come back and tell you who we're going to do it unto next week, so don't go anywhere. people walking around with big smiles on their faces and everything seems just fine. But there isn't a soul you know, and that includes you, who doesn't have something in their life that needs to be forgiven. And uh, when we stop for an hour and we talk just about that, it begins to remind us of Aunt Gertrude or maybe our father or maybe somebody who has demeaned us in the past. And um, we have a tendency to hide that. One of the good things about what God does for his people is when you ask him to show you, he does. And it's not always pleasant because you got to go through all the stuff that ticked you off in the first place. But he begins to let you know that uh, you got to do this one and you got to do this one and you got to do this one. And as you're in the process, you're going to sense freedom and joy that you never did. doesn't mean you have to forgive everybody completely. That's not easy, especially if it's been deep and hard stuff. It takes a while. But get in the process. And if you get in the process, it'll change your life. And I don't know anybody who says that any better than Mark. That was just a great hour. And uh, when you read the book, you'll be blown away with how dark. I mean, if you ever wonder if we live in a fallen world, we do. And most of us hide from the reality of the darkness and the lostness. And this book won't let you do that. So when it comes out, get a copy of it. Kathy, uh, who's going to be on next week? Next week, our friend. You have a lot of friends. I do. We have a lot of friends. We do. 
They like That's us. Called, it's, called a, it's called a standoff. We okay. know dirt on them, and they know dirt uh, on there us. There you go. There you go. Well, anyway. It makes for a good relationship. Our <laughs> friend, Rosaria Butterfield, will be with us next week. She has a new book out. We've had her before. We really liked her a lot. Her new book is titled Five Lies of Our Anti-Christian Age. She's... She was um, um, a woman yes, she study was. professor and a lesbian and a yep. angry at Christians kind of person, and God did a number on her. Absolutely. And she is articulate, and if you're on the other side, she's scary. <laughs> you did good. You don't want to go to a school board meeting if she's going to be there. <laughs> oh, man. She, go, she and her friend go to school board meeting, and they don't bring guns. But the people on the school board are glad they don't. They wouldn't hesitate to use them. But we'll talk with her next week, and you don't want to miss it. And we will be here, same time, same place. Hope you join us. And between now and then, don't do anything we wouldn't. That gives you a wide, wide berth.